Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Can everyone hear me okay? Good. Welcome right. today. Uh, welcome to our Mended Hearts organization. We're in uh, uh, partnership with Eisenhower Health. Would they help us out? We're working this meeting tonight. Uh, this is our first one for a while after summer, so welcome everyone back and welcome Zoom session as well. They are here. Uh, First thing I'd like to do is, is uh, introduce uh, Brett Klein. He's our clinic's marketing specialist. He's over there. He's handling the Zoom. Give us a wave. Thanks, Brett. Okay. Um, well, Men at Hearts, we've been an organization that's been around for over 50 years now. We've been around quite a while. Uh, we're here to go ahead and give encouragement and support to any heart patients and so forth that, uh, that come in. Uh, we have some Men at Hearts. We have some accredited visitors out there. Accredited visitors are the ones that will actually come out and visit the patients. If all our accredited visitors would stand up so we can go ahead and see who they are, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's one person that we don't see here tonight, and he should be up here speaking rather than me, and that would be Bill Stark. Uh, Bill is our president. He's been involved with Mended Hearts for well over 20 years now. He's our main guy, and, and uh, he's the glue of our organization, the Mended Hearts of Coachella Valley. Uh, Bill had a procedure, uh, 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 let's see, it was Tuesday over there. Uh, he's doing quite well. Um, he, uh, as a matter of fact, he's on Zoom right now watching us, so let's all wish Bill very well, but he's doing quite well over there, uh, and his wife Carol as well. Um, other than that, I think we're all set over here. We'll get cracking. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, we're going to have a nice lecture this, this afternoon or this evening. It's going to last one hour. After the lecture, we're going to go ahead and break off in peer groups. We'll take a 10-minute break, and we'll break off in peer groups, and we can go ahead and discuss items with our accredited visitors. We'll go ahead and do that. And I'll explain uh, which accredited visitors are going to talk about what, what uh, items over there. Uh, tonight, I'd like to introduce you to Linda Vincent, Lydia Vincent. Uh, she's a registered nurse, Eisenhower Chest Pain Coordinator. She's giving up her time. She's worked all day today and coming over here, going to go ahead and give us a nice lecture today. And she's got some interesting speakers along with her. So at this time, I'll go ahead and introduce to you Lydia. Thank you, Dick. Um, you guys may recognize me. I have come before a couple times to your group. I appreciate um, you guys letting us um, have this platform to talk about cardiac health. Um, in the past, I've come here to talk about um, signs and symptoms of cardiac events and what to do. Um, and part of my job as a chest pain coordinator here at Eisenhower is to help maintain our accreditation through the American College of Cardiology as a chest pain center. Um, and so some people may wonder, what does that do for us? Um, well, it, it allows, it says that we are doing the right things for our patients and we're following those guidelines um, that the ACC set for um, any patient that comes in with chest pain. So I'm going to share a little bit with you. Let's see here if I can get the screen to work. So I know you probably have heard about the U.S. News um, and World Report and how well Eisenhower has done in that. But part of that is also the ACC had a 27 page um, write up in the same report about their hospitals at, that participate in their accreditation services. And they have multiple accreditation services, they have multiple registries and multiple honors. And so they recognize their hospitals who participate in these things and we are one of those. Um, and they broke it down by state and depending upon what accredited accreditations, how many accreditations, how many registries that the hospital participates in, that gives you a ranking level within that state. And Eisenhower here in California is third on the list. So I think that's pretty good for our little community hospital here. This thing doesn't love me. There we go. And then we also have a, we are also heart failure accredited. 
Um, and we have a designation with our outpatient center. We have a heart failure clinic. And what that does for us as an organization, heart failure patients typically are patients that um, have a lot of trouble and they can have, um, have readmissions if they are not monitoring their medications and their weight and their diet like they should. So our heart failure clinic really helps those patients to understand their medications and their diet plan so that we can keep them from coming back in as a readmission or to the emergency room. And so um, the ACC also recognized um, hospitals who have this heart failure designation and they broke it up by um, region of the United States and in the West, we have Eisenhower and Loma Linda. So another um, great mark for us. Um, they also put in there, um, it's important um, for anyone to know if you need to find your heart a home, um, you can go to the ACC, find your heart a home, and they will compare the hospitals based on um, the care that they, um, they give. So we're listed in there. And then this is what I usually come and talk to you guys about is knowing the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. Um, and all of those symptoms are up there in those circles. We have anything, like I tell you, anything above the belly button could be um, cardiac. So don't ignore it. Um, we don't want anyone um, to have a cardiac event and definitely not go into cardiac arrest. But if that were to happen, we're gonna call 911, um, start CPR, utilize an AED if we have it available. And I also um, participate in our county um, STEMI program. And what that means, if we have a patient who um, shows up that they're having a, a massive heart attack at that moment and they need to be rushed to the cath lab, um, we, we um, <clears throat> try to get them there. Our hospital goal is within 60 minutes. But we talk about these patients regionally um, and um, within the county. So this is our Riverside County stats. So for quarter two, we had 134 cases that went to the hospital by EMS. And the door to balloon, or from the time that they came into the hospital and they got that vessel open for EMS patients was 57.1 minutes. And the scene time for those patients was 13.42 and we had a 94% discharge rate. So that's good, they were discharged alive, so that's good. For walk-ins, we had 40 cases. What I wanna bring out is that the door to balloon is 98.7, so that's a much higher time. So that's why it's so important and when we tell people to call 911 because you're just putting yourself at risk if you're not calling 911. 911, the EMS, they're an extension of our emergency room. They're gonna start emergent care. Um, and we're going to get, they're going to activate the cath lab before you ever even get to us. And we're going to get you into the hospital and into the cath lab quickly. So that's what I like to highlight on this screen. And then this is just a heat map of um, the patients, the STEMI patients within the, the county. And you can see here Eisenhower in the middle. We're pretty red here for, um, for this region. So we do have a high volume. Um, but by standard CPR, if someone... Um, were to have a cardiac arrest, bystander CPR. Um, when bystander CPR is administered to a cardiac arrest victim, 22.9% of the victims survived until they were admitted to the hospital and 11.9% were discharged alive. So bystander CPR can really save a life. And then AE, AED use prior to EMS arriving. So of, in this study of the cases in which an AED was applied before EMS arrives, 24% um, survived, and of those who received a shock from an AED applied before EMS arrived, 38% survived. So survival was 40% with application of an AED by a layperson, 16% for healthcare workers, and 13% for police. So we are very important in this emergency process. If someone were to have a cardiac event, that we are taking action um, and making sure that we are caring for those people. Um, so this is another um, slide that I found from the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Foundation and out of hospital cardiac arrest survival on average is 10%. When emergency first responders provide defibrillation, it's 28.6%. But when a lay bystander provides defibrillations and uses an AED, it's 53%. So, um, and that is um, what I wanted to talk to you guys about. Uh, make sure if you needed to, to call to save a life, someone was unresponsive without a pulse, you call 911. If there is an AED available, have someone grab the AED and do CPR. 
And that is my presentation today, but that brings me to talk about some of our people that are here. Um, we have with us today. Yes, sir. Lydia was going to say, if everyone can hold their questions, Lydia will go ahead and introduce her guests. They can go ahead and speak. And after all speaks, if they can all stay here, then we'll pass the microphone around and everyone can feel free to ask questions. Please use the microphone. Otherwise, the Zoom audience will not be able to hear you. So it'll work out a lot better than that. We'll pass the microphone around. Right now, she'll introduce everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So first, I want to introduce um, David Abel and Mr. Ronnie Clausen up here. Um, David had an event um, at a local gym, Orange Theory, and we have the owner here, Dr. Smith, who um, owns Orange Theory as well. But I want to hear about their story. So they're going to tell you a little bit about what happened and how they um, jumped into action. Hello. Hello, everybody. My name is Ronnie Clausen, and uh, this man over here is David Abel. Uh, I'm actually a coach at Orange Theory Fitness, and I was uh, the coach that administered CPR and AED and uh, helped save David Abel's life. I wasn't alone, not at all. We had a team of people there, of course, that, uh, you know, someone with the AED, I was there providing the CPR. We had crowd control, someone contact the emergency system. So, you know, emergency action plan was essential. Uh, however, the most important piece of it all was the fact that I uh, was educated in CPR and AED. Um, you know, I, I do want to mention this. It's very important to know. Uh, I think I'm being recognized for this. However, I'm no hero. Uh, I did my job uh, and I did what was supposed to be done in the moment of, you know, action. And I encourage you all, uh, if you're not CPR and AED certified, uh, do so. You never know if that's going to be needed, uh, you know, for yourself or someone you love. And I think that it becomes a little bit more pertinent and important and, and real when it happens to you or happens to someone you care about. I mean, I, I care about this guy more than, more than I really realize. I mean, I love David. Uh, being his coach, I've seen him go from, you know, you know, this guy's always been fit, but, you know, seeing him come from where he's been to see him where he is now and, and to see him still here, that means so much to me. I love this guy. And, you know, you can help save someone you love too by just knowing something so simple as AED and CPR. It's, it's, it really, I, I shouldn't say it's so simple. <laughs> you know, it's very, you know, it's challenging, but, you know, it's important. And so I'd love for David to kind of share his story as well, uh, or, or at least what had happened. Clearly, I have no problem talking. And if you don't take away this microphone from me, I'm going to keep talking. So go ahead, David, please. Okay. okay. Thanks, Ryan. If, if you're not the hero, I, uh, I'm still going to let you keep that Rolls Royce I gave you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's my car. Very thank you. <laughs> Oh, and about answering questions afterward, I'm happy to do that as well. Just make sure you put it in writing one week in advance before we get here. Okay. Um, how, how have I got? Five minutes? You're Two good. minutes? You're good. Okay. I mean, short, hour, <laughs> short story is I died and he saved me. I, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I thought it'd be uh, interesting for you to see a little bit of my background. Um, I'm a CPA, it's a very high stress uh, field for taxpayers at eight, April 15th, but it's been stretched to October 15th this year. So you're talking to me on the last day of my busy tax season. So I'm in a high stress. So if you do see me collapse, make sure this guy's around because I know he knows how to use that thing. <laughs> I, went to, um, I went to OTF about 12 years ago for the first time. When did you open your doors? 12, 13 years ago. No, it seems like a lot longer than that. I was there before they opened. They had this little orange bicycle out there, and, and I signed up. I was one of the first to sign up for all you can eat. That means you can go to their classes all the time. And, and there's not a gym. It's um, three rows of health maniacs competing on the, the rower, another 13 on the, um, the treadmills, and another 13 on the weight machines to get some resistance training. And, and it's, uh, for an old guy like me, with all those young punks around, I don't like to lose. <laughs> and I push myself. I lost 50 pounds, thank you very much, after my first year. I don't know what happened that first year. It just took a while for my cells to click in or something. But I was getting depressed. And all of a sudden, in January, a year later, it just melted off. 50 pounds and I've kept it off. So I'm very, very happy with this non-gym that uh, 
that I've been participating in. And I left that morning on my mountain house up in Garner Valley by Idlewild on my motorcycle with my gym bag in the back and uh, rode down, not expecting anything in the world. I exercise a lot. I diet. My wife is a, a vegan. That means I'm, well, I'm married to a vegan. You know what that means? <laughs> so I think I've had a good, healthy life. But I forgot about my heritage. My mother had quadruple bypass. She had carotid arteries. That should have been a writing on the wall. And I should have, should have paid more attention. Because I only had one sign that I was having a heart attack. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But I rode my bike down. Typical day. I do this five days a week because I joined the all you can eat. You know, and the more you, the more you work out, the more money you save, right? <laughs> like going to an all you can eat restaurant. I was there six days a week during tax season, trying to release the stress from the tax period. And I parked it out in, the, in their open park a lot. Uh, went in to do my gym thing. It happened to be a competition day. We were doing a catch me if you can. You start off on the treadmill at a, at a good pace. I'm a walker, a power walker. So it, the next couple of minutes is a shorter distance. No, I'm sorry, longer distance for the same time. Longer distance with the same time. So you're trying to catch yourself. And, and I was not going to be taken by all these little young guys. And so I knew the pace I had to maintain. And I did. And I, I think if you'll check the records, I was the only one that, that finished. <laughs> Very true. <That's> exactly <laughs> I gave you another bonus for that. <clears throat> then... I was, I was feeling like I kind of, I think I probably overdid that. I didn't have to win, but then, you know, it's the blood. In this. I went out to the lobby. Thank you very much. They have a bowl with these tangelos there to renourish, renourish myself and replenish the, the exercise they just did. It was a 30 minute thing. Is that 30 minutes? 25? Something like that. And I grabbed the tangelo and I ate half of it. And I went back into the class because my next section was the weights. And I had a half a tangelo left. And I looked to the girl on my left and said, would you like a tangelo? And she said, no, thank you. And I looked to the girl on my right. She was sitting on the weight bench already. And I gave her my eyebrow, which meant I'd really like to catch your names after this is over. And she gave me the thank you and took it, which means we'll see about that. <laughs> and she had it in her hand. And the next thing you know, things went dark. Now, I've, I've been, I'm the third of three boys, and they were always forced to take their little day-day everywhere they went. And they used me as target practice, as the guinea pig. I've climbed up ladders that were in the shallow end that was, you're supposed to jump when it gets to the deep end and splash, and it's gone the wrong way. And I've landed in the holly bush before and out. I've been under caves where they dug in to see if it was safe. Oh dear, it wasn't. I've, uh, I went in the cold water with my brothers going to um, uh, skin diving, snorkeling, and it was cold. And my brother, oldest brother said, you should acclimate yourself. Well, the younger one went in first. And so I went right after him without any wetsuit. And he had a wetsuit, my oldest brother. Next thing I know, my other brother and I are floating. And I feel something grab my hair and he's pointing down at, at the other guy. And I grab his hair and he pulls it. I blacked out, but that was a slow blackout. I was held back once in the water. They said, if you hold your breath past the time you start to black out, you get another 30 seconds. So there I am. <laughs> it just kind of fizzes out. And I've also been on stage before. I'm a child actor and I've been in several very famous you know, you know, it's not famous. It's high school. And I know what it means when they say the curtain's coming down. This blackness that I saw, I could see slowly a whole, well, I didn't look both ways, but it went on forever. And it was solid black, just like a curtain. And it was coming down. And I looked up. The doctor says, you're probably passing out. Your, your eyeballs were going up. And of course, it looked like it was going down. I don't believe it. I think I, it was curtains down for me. And I said to myself, I better get down on this rower seat. 
I don't know if I made it. Did I make it? No. Uh, unfortunately, I came into the studio and David was face down on the right in front of the railroad that he was asking to be on. And uh, uh, the, from there, we grabbed the AED. The response was immediate. Um, we had Amy grab the AED, our manager at the time. I was by David. We asked, actually, he's wearing the shirt that I cut off at the oh, time, yeah. right off. Just I great, mean, the, you know, the blade. Is- from there, we administered the AD, uh, the AD in order to make sure there was a heart rhythm. And there was no heart rhythm at the time. And right away, we administered CPR. And so because of that, because of quick action and because of the knowledge of the uh, CPR and AD, of course, we were able to save David's life. And thank God for that, really. So. Right. Was that? Was I face first? I felt a little bruise on my nose. Yes, yes, he was. Uh, <laughs> but, he, you know, he looked good. He, he landed well, gracefully. I'll tell you that. He looked good. Good. I didn't have my butt good. up in the air or anything no, like that. No, it, it wasn't a, a good pose. I wouldn't say that, you know, I wasn't going to take any pictures of you. <laughs> I looked up and the girl still had her half of the tangelo. <laughs> and I thought, she's probably afraid of eating that thing now. See what that could happen to people. And then I looked up ahead of me and this gorilla's on top of me saying, it works, holding two paddles, it works. <laughs> Probably not how that happened, is it? That's, That's the way exactly. I visualize it. A little dramatization there, but it sounds good. No. He, stood, he was sitting beside me saying, who am I? Where are you? What day is it? And I said, you're, you're Ronnie, and I'm at the gym. Can I finish? <laughs> he wanted to get back to work. He wanted to work back out. Yeah. You want to get, keep going. So I'll tell you that. And amazing. why did you tear my shirt? <laughs> <laughs> I actually wore this so you know the victim from the hero. So <laughs> then he helped me up to the uh, outside bleacher or bench where he said, or somebody said, the ambulance is here. And I said, oh, no, I don't even need an ambulance. And the ambulance guy came and said, you're going to the hospital. You've been zapped. People are zapped. Gotta go. I'm not going to let you go. What's it going to look like? He said, well, let me ride my bike to the hospital. I don't want to leave it here. You're not riding the bike. You go over. I get canned. You get screwy. And no, you're going in the ambulance. And I know it was a, a bumpy ride because my intravenous kept, intravenous, is that what they call it? Kept falling out as they went down the road. And then and when I got to the emergency room, none of the doctors could find out what was wrong with me. None of the machines were working. You know, they're just emergency doctors. They're not cardiac doctors. And, and I kept saying, well, can I go home? I'm still sitting with this shirt on, this shirt open. I won't go demonstrate that part to you, but in my wet jeans, I mean, shorts like this guy's yeah. dress. I was still in this stuff for an hour waiting for them to find out if the machine would work. They could tell anything's wrong with me. And, and they said, well, let's, let's uh, you know what? There's a cardiac surgeon that's just in the same building we're going to send him a copy of of your heart report they got the i don't know a cat scan or an x-ray or something on my chest and cardiac surgeon says i'll be right over and he, he just explained to me quietly he says you know um there's something in there i'm just going to take a peek at it you can watch it on the big screen here I'm just going to go right in your wrist and you won't even see a scar. I don't see, you see that scar? I don't see anything. Right there. Oh, very, really. Yeah. Okay, you can see it. He's just, I'm just going to go peek. And if there's something there, we'll know and you'll know because you'll see some nice blue stuff coming out of one end and not the other. I, said, I don't see anything. He says, We're going to fix that. I was 95% occluded. I was 100% until he pop this little bubble that firmly closed it thank you very much and i you said it took two pushes mm-hmm. strong hands i just know uh it, it took uh two rounds uh total of 60 compressions and about four breaths in total to bring him back to life so it wasn't he wasn't out for ter- terribly long uh the proficient use of the the presses and the breath of course i would imagine so wait a minute you're uh, saying about breath are we, uh, are we buddies now? <laughs> we got a little too close that day, you know, but hey, listen, hey, we did what had to be done. That's for sure. That is for sure. All right. Okay. And then the machine said, get off, push the button, right? Correct. We had to shock you. Okay. That was a wonderful experience. The doctor, <laughs> the doctor that was working on me said, yeah, we're going to let you have a little bit of funny gas and we're going to put this thing in, but you can watch it. And he was talking to his crew this is what's supposed to happen. This is how it's supposed to work. It can happen. And he kept looking at me and he kept pointing up. He says, this is for you. This is somebody 
Some little angel, did you know you're a messenger from the top? <laughs> There's some reason you're still here that this is this doesn't happen. I've got five fingers I can count on people that have come back from CPR and AED. Five. Four with crushed ribs or or this thing sternum or mentis non compass. And one, you're my one. Thank you. You're my one. So that, that surgeon didn't really uh, reach my understanding yet of what happened to me. Ron told me on the phone, he said, what happened? He says, your heart stopped. You know, I just thought the heart stopped. But it, when my son called me from Temecula, he says, I'm coming to pick up mom. We're coming to see you. Now I'm going to be gone in a few minutes on my motorcycle. <laughs> he says, I don't care if you're gone in an hour. We're coming to see you. I don't want you to die again. And that's when it hit me. I said, die again? I died. I died and I'm back. And it doesn't happen that often. And I'm grateful for this non-hero here and for the the tools that are made. Thank you very much. And now I'm up being her part. Would you say Amy? Amy was a part? Okay. Uh, the doctor on my first visit, he didn't ask me if I had any questions. He just kept barreling questions that, are you married? Yeah. You got kids? Yeah, I got four kids. You got grandkids? I got, I got hundred kids. You got a good work? Yeah, I love my job. It's, it's a little stressful, but it's you know, I'm semi-retired now. I only go in every Monday, Wednesday, Friday from noon to one, you know. <laughs> so he said, that's good. That's good. So you got a good life. You're back to life. And you're, be prosper, you know. And time's up. <laughs> I didn't get to ask any questions. What happened, Doc? So I put the pieces together afterwards. And it's, it's just, well, it's nice to be here. It's nice to be here. Now you may ask me questions. <laughs> and I just, I just want to say also for David, um, we have a very um, intensive cardiac rehab program, and and he has been participating in our cardiac rehab program religiously. Graduated. Graduated today. <laughs> yes, yes, and so um, very proud of him for that, um, and proud of our program. Um, and our new, um, new gym over there. It's pretty, pretty cool. But also I have something for you, Ronnie. Right. So, very You're welcome. Oh, you. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you, Thank you so much. So <laughs> wow. um, we just want to present Ronnie with this five-star community award um, at, for being a, a hero in our community and not being afraid um, to take action when action is needed. Um, thank so thank you, thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. It's, a, it's truly an honor. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, everybody. And in this video, especially, thank you. Like I said, though, I mean, I will accept this graciously. Perfect. But of course, you know, I, I want to say again, I just did my job, everybody, as a human being. I did my job, not just as a coach, but as a human. You know, we, we, we are in this together. And, you know, that's the only way out is together as well. So I'm not letting this guy go alone. That's for sure. So thank you very much. If I, if I could add, I didn't have a plaque for him, but this guy hadn't filed his taxes since he was reaching oh, yeah. puberty, which was uh, very young, and we got him all caught up. So, yeah, so thank you very much. It was, <laughs> it was a win-win situation. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. Yeah. And then we, we have um, one, more, one more story as well. Um, I want to invite Mr. David Didley. Dibley. I was going to say that wrong. I apologize. Mr. David Dibley has a very similar story and so happy that he is here with us to tell it. So come join us, David. All right. Thank you very much. I recognize many people here. I've been a member of Mended Hearts for the last five years since I had my incident. Um, and Mended Hearts have been a big part of my recovery. But oddly enough, uh, my name is David David's name is David. He was he is a CPA. I was a CPA before I retired. So any CPAs named David, I guess you better be careful. Listen to your doctor. Uh, so so my story uh, happened about five and a half years ago. 
Um, it was a Wednesday. I don't remember anything of this day. Everything that I'm telling you is what somebody told me. So I had been working from home here in Palm Springs. And uh, my husband and I went to the Palm Springs Swim Center for a noon workout. And we had adjacent lanes in the pool, started doing our workout. And uh, the next thing I know, I woke up at Desert Regional four days later. So the story he told me is that he finished a lap, looked back across the pool, and he saw me floating face down on the water. And he swam right over to me, flipped me over, said I was already turning shades of green and blue that he had never seen before. So of course he yelled and the lifeguards were coming, uh, running to the spot where I was. There happened to be a doctor doing his own workout in the pool at the same time. So he came over and he helped the lifeguards start administering CPR. I had no pulse. I was not breathing. I had water in my lungs. Uh, they used the AED on me as well. There's one at the Palm Springs Swim Center. So I will say if, if something like this was going to happen to me, it probably was the best place in the world that could have happened to have lifeguards and the AED right there on the spot to administer first aid and CPR immediately. So the ambulance showed up. They got me to the hospital. I think it was around 10, 12 minutes from the time I was found until I was in the ER. And by the time I got to the hospital, they had restored pulse and I was breathing a little bit with assistance. Um, but again, they kept me in an induced coma for four days because they didn't know how long I had been in the water, um, how long I had been unconscious, that there might've been any, anything wrong with the brain. And they had to figure out what was going on with the heart. So I remember that Sunday morning in the hospital kind of coming to a little bit and thinking I had had this really, really bad dream that I was in a hospital bed, that I was hooked up to stuff and I just had no idea what was going on. I just couldn't believe what a crazy dream I'd had. And then I opened my eyes and I was in a hospital bed and I was hooked up to all these machines. And I started thinking, what the heck happened? And Drew happened to be there and he started slowly to let me know what had happened to me. And he said, I just wagged my finger at him like, no, that's not a true story. You can't be telling me the truth. Um, but they did more testing, determined that all of my coronary arteries were 95 to 100% blocked. So I'd had a sudden cardiac arrest. Um, and one week to the day after it happened, they did a quadruple bypass on me. And five days after the quadruple bypass, I went home. So um, it was quite an adventure. Uh, I had great care at Desert Regional. You know, when we talk about heroes and people acting fast to help you out, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the lifeguards at the pool, if it wasn't for the doctor that gave up his own workout, for the EMTs that got me to the hospital, for the nurses while I was in the hospital, for the doctor who did the surgery, everybody. Um, I can't thank them enough. I still see Dr. Habibi Poor. Uh, I volunteer at Desert Regional now, and I still see him when I walk around the hallways. I saw him this morning and said hello. He remembers me. Um, I saw him at the gym, I think three months after the surgery, I was just on a stationary bike trying to get some exercise and he was working out on his own and went and chatted with him and he remembered exactly who I was and had some advice on um, some uh, cholesterol medication I could take. Um, so that was, that was really great to see him and, uh, and I still see him to this day. Um, and some lessons I've learned from the soul experience is is listen to your doctor and be aware of what's going on with your heart. High cholesterol ran in my family. Uh, I had been tested for high cholesterol um, and the doctor had advised that I get on statins and I resisted. I thought, I exercise a lot, I'm a healthy guy, I eat pretty well, I'll just try and control my cholesterol with my diet. So I never got on statins. I'm on statins now. So one way or another, they were gonna get me on statins. Um, and yeah, just, um, you know, it's inspired me to help at Desert Regional volunteer, uh, to volunteer with Men at Hearts to give back. But there's one more, more person I want to call out, um, a Men at Hearts volunteer by the name of Ed Trost. It was the day I was being discharged from the hospital. I was laying in the hospital bed feeling, you know, down because I didn't know how this was going to affect me going forward. If I could exercise, what kind of an active life I could have after having all of this happen to me. And he came in and said, I'm Ed, I'm from Mended Hearts. You mind if we chat for a little bit? And he told me his story and how he was still biking, leading a pretty regular athletic lifestyle. He plays pickleball. We played pickleball together a number of times. Um, and it really gave me hope. 
really kind of, you know, helped me a lot to understand that a normal life could still be mine and I could still do a lot of the things I wanted to do. Just take your rehab seriously, get back in shape, eat well. And, um, and I'm here to this day and I still feel pretty good. So it's been five and a half years and uh, I'm very thankful and very grateful um, that what happened to me happened to me where it happened and the people around me were able to save my life. So that's my story. What we'll do now is we'll bring the whole group over here and we're open for questions. Uh, please wait. George is going to go ahead and pass the microphone around for questions. Uh, keep in mind that we need to use the microphone, otherwise the Zoom audience cannot hear you. So if we could have everyone come up here and then uh, you can go ahead and screen questions any way you'd like, Lydia. So if any questions, go ahead and raise your hands. Should be live. Hello? I, I don't have a question, actually, but I think, um, David, you need to tell everybody else what you did, your, your great story. Oh, um, yeah, so uh, two and a half years after the surgery, so it'd be three, year, three years ago, uh, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Wow. Um, so uh, that was a really big goal of mine was to get back in shape. And a friend of mine really wanted to climb the mountain. And we had talked about it. So um, it was not the easiest thing I've ever done. And I, and I did tell Drew. Uh, when I was done with it, I said, if I ever mentioned to you that I want to climb another mountain, I said, just slap me really hard, knock some sense into me. But it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, in hindsight, I really enjoy doing it. But I, again, that's just, you know, taking the rehab seriously and doing what you can to get back in as, as good a shape as you can be after something like this. So I was lucky enough to be able to, to accomplish that as well. So. David, number one, <laughs> um, when you went into the hospital and they discovered you had the blockage, um, what did they do? Did they put a stent in or did you have a bypass? Yeah, I was, I was fortunate. All my secondary arteries looked fairly clean and it was just my right artery that was 95% blocked and they put two stents in. He acted like that was something glorified. I put two in. <laughs> one on the other side of the blockage and one right, I, I guess they, the, the balloon pumps the, the blockage out of the way and the, the metal or titanium or whatever it is, the springy thing that holds it up uh, hardens and they take the balloon away. And it, I got a 30 year warranty. I'm going to take it. <laughs> and there was one other thing I was going to, I mentioned, mentioned is this Apple watch I use it all the time for my exercise. It tells me if I'm going over my speed limit for my heart rate when I mean, I'm on the bicycle or climbing in the mountains or rowing or whatever I'm doing. Orange Theory starts at 120 heartbeats and I was restricted to only 118. So I'm going to work on it, but I'm, I'm not supposed to even go into the orange zone from now on. But I asked the doctors uh, in the emergency room, if you're not going to let me go home, I, I've had... Uh, two arrests, one my heart and one you guys. I get two phone calls. And he says, who are you going to call? He says, your, your, your uh, son called you from Kentucky, called the hospital from Kentucky. Your partner called you from, from the office. Your wife called you from up in the mountains. I said, how, how, how did they know I was here? Your watch. <laughs> when I didn't respond to, did you fall? it automatically sent out messages to my three contacts. They knew I was on the way to the hospital before I did. It's amazing little critter. And it's been my monitor for all my exercises. So if you don't got one, it also gives your heart rate, your uh, atrial defibrillation, and it's, they're working on the diabetics. And what else do they do? The, 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 the oxygen flow, I'm at 95% right now. My blood pressure is up. Yep, I'm not excited. <laughs> it's a wonderful little tool, and I'm, I'm happy to be uh, activated. I didn't have to call anybody. <laughs> I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, 
the first one would be for uh, Lydia. Uh, what kind of what kind of an advantage did the Davids and Davids have as far as being already in good shape, being active, and so forth, as far as their recovery uh, was involved in that? And then I'll have a question for uh, Ronnie right after that. What kind of training he had to go ahead and make himself capable of of this life saving situation? So the two questions. Yeah, I think both of the Davids were in a great situation as far as they've been already doing the um, things that they could do to keep themselves healthy. Um, that always helps with recovery when you already have everything else is, is strong and you're not having to build that up. Um, uh, unfortunately, we can't do a lot about our genetics and that seems to be maybe what, 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 you know, what got these guys. And that's what I go out and teach the community is, you know, do everything you can about the things that you can control, but then also be aware of, of your genetics and stay on top of that. So it sounds like they were doing the right things. Unfortunately, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer for men and women. And that's why it is so important to not, um, you know, don't ignore any of the symptoms and don't ignore your own, um, your own, own genetics. So, um, but the fact, yeah, absolutely. The fact that they were in good health and they were already taking care of themselves made it a lot easier for them to recover and to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I mean, goodness, <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> oh, and Ronnie. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, thank you for the question. I, and uh, just to tag on to what Lydia said, I, we always call it in the industry prehabilitation, right? Not rehabilitation, but it's like prehab, right? You're always making sure you're good to go. It always gives you a step ahead in case something happens anyways. About the question though, with the education of the CPR and AD, it was a requirement for my bachelor's degree for exercise science in order to do so. Uh, however, with that being said, I had to practice on a specific dummy, a physical dummy where you would have to press into the chest and actually give breasts, which I think was the most important option. I've taken recertifications as well online. Uh, and maybe some of you have as well, where it's just tests, questions. I mean, honestly, personally, I did take the test right beforehand. It was a recertification. It was almost ironic the fact that like about a week and a half before I was recertifying myself so that it was fresh in my head. However, if I had never had that physical demonstration where I had to watch the chest rise, lift the chin and really press to feel how deep you need to press, you would, I would have never been experienced. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if I would have been able to successfully bring David back to life. So I would encourage you if you do get certified, take the extra time, take, spend the extra money if you need to, to get the physical dummy done. It's actually, you know, it's, it's very important. So just want to say that. And thank you for the question, because, you know, I did want to mention that about the, the physical versus the, the non-tangible uh, dummy. So that's a, it's a great thing to say. Wait a minute. What, what kind uh -oh. of dummy am I? Oh, uh -oh, uh -oh, uh -oh, <laughs> oh, no. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. You so thank you. Thank you. Did you want to get a picture? Well, thank you, David, Lydia, David. Uh, appreciate all your uh, uh, information and so forth. Great. I love to hear the stories you tell. They're just wonderful. Uh, at this time, we're going to go ahead and take about a 10 minute break. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, we have a few people over here. Excuse me, just a moment. I got a paper here. We're going to take about a 10 minute break. We've got some goodies over there. Uh, I'm going to swear you all to secrecy over there. We have some nice vegetables and fruits. We have some cookies and brownies. So keep the secret. Don't anybody know those heart patients over here are eating brownies and cookies. We'd all appreciate that. Or if you're going to take them, sneak them out so no one can really see and so forth. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and take a 10 minute break. After that, uh, we're going to go ahead and break off with some peer groups. And you're lo we'd love to have you stay as well and so forth. But uh, we have, uh, if anybody's got any questions on a coronary artery by bypass, we have Warner can go ahead and speak with you on that. Warner, raise your hand, please. Okay. Then on mitral valve, uh, any questions on mitral valve, we can have Michael discuss a little bit of that. There's Michael over there. Um, anything on heart failure, I'll be around. I'll, I'll go ahead and speak with peer groups on that. And then we have Carolyn. Carolyn, raise your hand. Uh, Carolyn's going to go ahead and she's quite familiar with the STEMIs and uh, microcardial infarctions and so forth. Uh, so we can talk to her. So let's all go ahead and, and take a 10 minute break. And I believe uh, we're going to be, uh, we're going to uh, go ahead and leave Zoom at this time. So thanks again, Matt, for setting all this up. All right. Okay, so we'll take a 10 minute break, have some goodies over there. Hope you stick around and then we'll get together with some groups. Thank you. <laughs>